Hello, once, welcome once again. We heard earlier from Mr. Krishna and Ms. Odriambo. Our opening keynote today will be about accelerating ASEAN recovery in a sustainable way, an opportunity in the decade of action. For this, please help me welcome Mr. Elliot Harris, Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development and Chief Economist, United Nations. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings from New York. It's a great pleasure and a privilege for me to join you at this very important event today. I regret only that I can't be there in person. Ladies and gentlemen, the world has become a much more fractious place of late, and it seems difficult to achieve the kind of global agreement that brought us the Sustainable Development Agenda and the SDGs, as well as the Paris Agreement a mere five years ago. That willingness to cooperate across borders and regions, that spirit of multilateralism, it has suffered. But one thing we all agree upon is the need for our recovery from this COVID-19 crisis to put us in a better place than we were in before. And a large part of that agreement is built on the ever-widening acceptance of the principles of sustainability as reflected in the concept of ESG that is increasingly underpinning business practices and investment decisions. I think a large part of this willingness to embrace sustainability in mainstream business and finance is linked to technological change. We have seen technologies of clean and renewable energy, for example, become fully established and completely cost competitive. And that has driven a, a change, a shift in mindset as the world has moved away from seeing environmental sustainability as a, an expensive add-on luxury to seeing it as something that is needed and feasible. The importance of the task force on climate-related financial disclosure should also not be underestimated. For the first time, really serious people, financial sector people, have taken the issue of climate and linked it definitively to financial performance and risk. That's made it possible for private business more generally to take seriously the impact of climate change and environmental factors more generally. And they have built their businesses around these changes and understood how these changes and these risks can affect the bottom line. And that in itself has opened the door for many finance professionals who long realized that there was much more to an investment than merely the short-term financial return to start integrating these other considerations into financial decision-making. And this, I think, is how we have now got to the concept of the triple bottom line, allowing us to move one step closer to finally debunking that myth that sustainability is somehow bad for business. ESG has been around for a long time, but it's only really come into its own in the last five years or so. Its mainstreaming hasn't been easy, and it certainly hasn't been completed yet, although some regions are pressing ahead quite rapidly. It's a challenging concept, and I might add, it's a concept that has not yet made its way into the lecture halls of the main business schools. It requires different information and data than is needed for standard business models, and collecting these data is not a negligible undertaking. It imposes a longer-term planning horizon than typically set by our overly short-term capital markets. It requires managers and financial analysts to consider factors that do affect the business and the return, but are not of the business. And perhaps most importantly, there's still no single standard or set of metrics acceptable to all, and still some competition among standard setters, and clearly, quite some way to go before the markets find the degree of convergence that will sing signal the end of the transition period. And it's for that reason that I tend to think of metrics as being the next frontier in the ESG space. It seems a little superfluous to talk to an assembly of business people about the importance of metrics and of measurement. But I'm going to raise the issue because I think it is a really critical one. As an economist, my bread and butter has always been GDP. It's a truly marvelous concept, not very uh, difficult. It's an extremely powerful concept as well. A single measure that captures an incredibly wide range of different activities and valuations into a number that everyone can understand. And what's key here is that it means the same thing to everyone all the time. Of course, we all know of its many shortcomings in particular that it says nothing about other matters of concern, rising concern to us all. 
the state of the environment, the quality of the growth of the economy, its sustainability, its equity, etc. There have been many initiatives aimed at going beyond GDP, but we haven't actually gone beyond GDP for exactly that reason. Too many initiatives, each of them addressing a different aspect of the problem. There's a lot I could and would say about this, but my point is that this is a major shortcoming holding back the progress towards achieving true universality in ESG-oriented business and financial decision-making. I would like, I would like it, of course, if markets could converge around a given standard, but I'm not confident that they would do so around a standard that is sufficiently ambitious within a sufficiently ambitious time frame. No, I do think that there is a real role for government and for regulators in setting a framework for thinking about these matters that can help the convergence process. And in many respects, the European Union's taxonomy could well contribute to this. I've heard and read a lot about the taxonomy, with many expressing concern that it is very much tailored to the structure of the European economies, perhaps not directly applicable to other contexts, including the ASEAN one. This may very well be the case. But if the European taxonomy drives convergence around an ESG standard and the associated metrics, then this will be an issue that the ASEAN business and financial world will have to take seriously. Some observers have suggested it would be better for ASEAN or more broadly for the Asia-Pacific region to develop its own taxonomy. I won't take a position on that. There are evidently pros and cons. But I do take note of the increasing activity of ASEAN regulators and policymakers in this ESG space. Once again, I don't want to go into detail on these various initiatives. You're all very familiar with them. Suffice it to say that the public sector in your economies will not be caught napping in this area. Of course, as disclosure and reporting become more widespread, either because it's required by stock markets and or regulators, or more importantly because investors require it, the demand for comparable information will necessarily drive convergence to some extent. And the wider interest and activity in the ESG investing space is already sparking heightened interest among regulators. Their interventions may very well drive progress towards common metrics and universally accepted standards. But even as we achieve progress on this front, challenges will remain. Most of the non-financial existing ESG metrics are reported separately from the financial metrics. Accounting systems are not yet up to set up sorry, to track the return on ESG investments and to integrate that return into an overall return of an enterprise. Moreover, many of the factors that contribute to good ESG performance are very difficult to monetize. They are intangibles. It would be possible, I suppose, to put a number to the risk that is avoided through ESG investments, but it wouldn't be easy. And it certainly could not be included in the financial data reported as per regulatory requirements, at least not at this stage. But that is, in essence, the very same problem that we face with our old friend GDP. And perhaps the financial world can draw some inspiration from how we are moving to change GDP itself from within. Next year, the process of integrating the system of environmental and economic accounts into the system of national accounts, the very basis of GDP, will begin. This is possible because the statisticians of the world have come up with an agreed approach to the thorny question of valuation of non-monetary assets. And this will allow us to agree on how we assign a value to the ecosystem services that we benefit from, to the value of the stock of our natural assets, our forests, our waterways, our land. It'll allow us to integrate changes in these stocks into the very calculation of GDP. It is a major, almost a revolutionary step forward. And that may very well be a guide to reflections on how to integrate the financial and the non-financial reporting that companies will soon all be required to produce. ESG investing and sustainable finance, they are rapidly evolving into the new normal. It is no longer a choice or an option. Those companies that cannot disclose their ESG-related performance will find it increasingly difficult to mobilize finance on competitive terms. Now, for some time, the ESG movement was driven by a few forward-thinking firms and by the growing interest of investors, especially as the sustainability agenda forced them to take on a longer-term view of the return on investment. 
What we are also seeing increasingly are the net zero commitments by individual firms, by major institutional investors, and now by entire countries. These are driven by the rising awareness of how immediate the climate crisis has become. But what is interesting in these commitments is that the investors, the companies, they're not only committing to achieving a net zero carbon footprint in their own operations, but they're looking for net zero footprints of their entire asset portfolio or of their entire supply chains. I find it, for example, significant and laudable that your own Petronas has recently announced its own commitment to reaching net zero by 2050, while at the same time signaling its intention to pursue new avenues of revenue generation via investments in nature-based solutions and by moving towards uh, clean energy solutions. This type of announcement by this type of company has a tremendous signal effect. It is also a sign of the times. But as these commitments to net zero carbon footprints along the entire global supply chain proliferate, they also raise the attention on how suppliers can be encouraged to adopt sustainable ESG compliant practices. Increasingly, we're seeing sustainable finance transactions in trade being used to help suppliers as well as buyers to adopt ESG models. We're seeing innovations in financial instruments along these lines, including a, a new model that I recently read about that uses technologies such as blockchain and smart contracts to collect and record social or ecological data on suppliers who in return get preferential access to trade finance. I raise this specific issue for two reasons. One, ASEAN is the fourth largest trading bloc in the world. Trade is essential to your growth and your prosperity, always has been. But as we all seek to recover from the disruptions to global supply chains unleashed by COVID, there's a real opportunity to build back better, to drive the principles of ESG deeper into supply chains and to generate significant improvements in the overall sustainability of global trade. And this cannot come too soon. As mentioned, several countries have announced truly ambitious climate targets for themselves, which will require, among other things, higher carbon prices. But with countries moving at different paces, companies in these countries that face stricter carbon regulation are increasingly concerned about possible competitive disadvantages relative to companies in countries with less stringent approaches. Because this opens the possibility of an increase in the so-called carbon leakage. Now, this issue of carbon leakage might have been one of theoretical concern a few years ago, but with these recent country commitments and with the individual commitments by companies, the discussions around border carbon adjustments are in fact becoming more frequent. Their impact on global trade must be a matter of concern as well. And it's with this point that I want to end. I said at the outset that the spirit of multilateralism, of collaboration and cooperation has been in decline. This is not just a matter of sclerosis. Our multilateral system has come under outright attack in some quarters. The first victim of this is trade. But we all face the same danger from climate change. Trade can't be excluded from that e equation. It, too, must become more sustainable, more climate resilient. And for a region such as ASEAN, with trade in its very DNA, and itself facing mounting environmental and climate-related challenges, this has to be a matter of pressing concern. Happily, today, the tools are available to make the necessary changes, Today, the mindset is shifting in the right direction, and today the consensus is building around the need to integrate ESG-related performance into all business uh, decisions and into all finance decisions. I encourage us all to move ahead with this shift towards ESG and sustainable finance, and with the transition to ESG-compliant supply chains and sustainable global trade. This is one of those elements of recovery of building back better that will put us firmly on the trajectory towards sustainable development, enable us to reach our targets by 2030, despite the setbacks we've encountered, and providing us with the perspective of a truly sustainable future for us all. 
I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Harris, for that uh, insightful uh, speech. I think what's very interesting is the valuation of non-monetary assets, which will be starting next year, that should set us a different trajectory. So we'll continue in just a moment with our first panel session. Thank you.